Nice. I had a subscriber ask me if I felt like Kokanee were doomed, and I thought that was kind of a an odd question. He was asking it in the context of, is it really worth investing in all this Kokanee gear if they're really just gonna, these fisheries are just gonna go away? And I guess just because of the struggles that a lot of cold water fisheries have had in the western United States, especially salmon and steelhead runs have really been depleted, uh, I guess it's a reasonable question. There we go, first one of the day. So today I thought I'd talk about the reasons why I think kokanee are a relatively safe bet for most anglers, but also provide some cautionary tales about some kokanee populations that actually have suffered or declined or have even just gone away completely. Um, these fish are not immune to all of the same other challenges that salmon, steelhead, and other cold water species like trout face. Uh, so today I'm at Spectacle Lake in north central Washington. I actually spent the morning fishing up at Palmer Lake, uh, which is a lake about 15-20 minutes from here. Nice slice kokanee. And I think Palmer Lake provides a very good example of how we need to be careful in terms of taking these fisheries for granted. 2016, lots of anglers started reporting kokanee jumping like crazy on the surface at Palmer Lake, and anglers were also reporting that large numbers of fish being caught with really heavy infestations of parasite uh, known as a copepod. Now these copepods were infested all over the fish. They were, they bury into the skin of the fish, they get into the gills of the fish, and these fish were just absolutely covered in these parasites, while none of the other species in the lake seem to have been affected. Uh, shortly thereafter, catch rates in Kokanee started to decline rapidly on the lake, and because that lake was sustained naturally by spawning fish um, in a feeder creek, uh, Sinlahican Creek, uh, they did surveys in the fall to see how many fish were spawning there, and there's essentially none. And the following year, the fishery was completely gone and collapsed. Now, it was a drought year and it was excessively hot like so many years in the West have been. We're, we've been in a 20 year drought now. We've been getting these insanely long and intense heat waves that you know used to come on in August. Now they're coming on in June and July and we're just shattering records every year in terms of heat intensity and number of days above 90 and number of days above 100 degrees. And potentially that could be what was the underlying cause um, in the collapse of the Palmer Lake Kokanee fishery is that maybe this sh the stress from the heat uh, just weakened these fish's immune systems to the point that they could just be overwhelmed by these parasites. It's really hard to say. They don't know for sure uh, what caused it, but what was clear is it affected all age classes of kokanee and they were gone. Now they've started reintroducing fish in there and some anglers have had some success um, pulling fish out of that lake. I had none today for two hours. I had no bites. I marked large schools of fish, which could have been kokanee. Um, there's also large numbers of yellow perch in there that suspend, so it's really hard to say. But needless to say, the, the lake is n sort of a shell of what it used to be in terms of a kokanee fishery. Still there? Nice. So one of the reasons why I do feel like kokanee are actually safer than some other species is that there's a lot of engagement with these fish and wildlife agencies, especially in a lot of states are expanding kokanee. So even when these kokanee fisheries do collapse, They usually restock them, um, and that's what they did with Palmer, right? So fortunately that same stock had actually been stocked from Palmer Lake into other nearby lakes, and they were able to bring back that original stock back to Palmer, which those fish used to grow to pretty substantial sizes, anywhere from 16 to 20 inches in some good years. Now it's well and good that uh, these fish and wildlife programs are restocking these fish when these fisheries collapse and a lot of fisheries, kokanee fisheries, depend on stocking and 
I don't see that changing. I see expansion of kokanee fisheries, especially in Washington State and in Utah, for certain. But there are some situations where uh, there's really no water to restock these fish in. So if you look at Wikiup Reservoir in Central Oregon, that used to be one of the premier kokanee fisheries in the United States, consistently producing fish in excess of 20 inches. And uh, because of litigation and drought, the, the reservoir uh, has essentially gone dry. It's getting drained every year to maintain water levels for uh, irrigation and endangered frogs. And it's just sucking all the water out of the reservoir. It doesn't help that the reservoir is coming out of the winter at 75% capacity or lower because of these droughts and lack of snowpack. So what we've seen there is that I don't think that kokanee fishery is going to come back anytime soon unless we start getting a lot more rain and snow in the Cascade and I just don't see that happening given the current trajectories of our climate. Another next year's fish. These fish are all feeding uh, really tight to the shore today in about 30 feet of water only 15 foot down. Jeez, that's a hit. <laughs> oh, well, this feels like a much heavier fish. Likewise, some of the Western North America's like best kokanee fisheries, like well known for giant kokanee, all lie on the upper portions of the Colorado River drainage system. And this year, Lake Powell is at the lowest it's ever been. The Colorado River is so low uh, that they're actually, for the first time in history, going to be drawing down. Uh, some of the best kokanee fisheries in the West to feed water in the Lake Powell so it can continue to produce hydroelectric power. Whoa, there we go. Yeah. So this includes reservoirs like Flaming Gorge Reservoir, which they're going to draw down four feet, uh, Navajo Reservoir in New Mexico, which they're going to draw down two feet, and Blue Mesa Reservoir in Colorado, which is already at very critically low levels. They're going to draw it down eight feet, which might render most of the boat ramps totally unusable to recreational anglers. So even if those drawdowns don't represent a threat to kokanee at this point in terms of the population, um, sure those fish are going to get more concentrated, but I don't see it being an extinction or extirpation level event at those lakes. Um, I mean, what good is it if we can't access those reservoirs as anglers? So yes, just because there's water there and there's kokanee in that water, if you can't put a boat out there and catch those fish, is it really a viable fishery at that point? You have to ask yourself. There's fish. Yes. I think one of the more interesting stories of a kokanee population's demise is that of the kokanee population at Lake Nantenhala, and that is in North Carolina of all places. So there was a brief moment of time, maybe a half a decade, decade, where some of the largest kokanee in the United States were being produced in this lake in North Carolina. There were fish uh, over four pounds being caught with some consistency. And uh, just as suddenly as that lake came online, it went totally dark and a big part of that was is somebody illegally introduced uh, invasive blueback herring which compete for the same plankton resources that kokanee do and those kokanee essentially just disappeared from that lake in a matter of a couple years due to who competition that was on the dropper the jumper That is a tank. One in the mouth, one in the chin. That's a dandy. Only running one ounce at uh, about 40 feet. They are very near the surface. So all these examples definitely serve as cautionary tales, but I find they're more the exception than the norm. Most kokanee fisheries are fairly stable. Double going. Oh. oh, bumped him right off. You 
kidding me? That sucks. Sorry about the noise. I got military jets and firefighting equipment just constantly cruising by. There's a fire just up the lake for me. one. So even though you know water temps are getting warmer and water levels are getting lower in the west, I still have a good feeling about Kokanee generally. Um, most of the lakes that they inhabit and are stocked in tend to be deep lakes that uh, tend to stay a little bit cooler. They can always find those refuges, that refugia, those cold water refuges deeper down below the thermocline. And that's what gives me hope. I mean, I've been fishing for Kokanee now for the better part of a decade, and for the most part, most lakes have remained fairly stable. Of course, Kokanee are very cyclical in their size, but and their populations go up and down, and the average size of Kokanee goes up and down. But overall, I would say that I've had very few lakes that have just vanished in terms of fishery and fishing opportunity. Doing the cut plug. Gill wrap. They always do that. They get hooked in the mouth and they swing around and the line gets wrapped around their gills and they come in like a corkscrew. Oh, man. There we go. I would still love to see, though, at a national level, an organization dedicated to promoting kokanee and kokanee fishing. I see some organizations at the state level, Kokanee Power, I think exists in a couple states, but I think a national movement would really help to safeguard uh, access to Kokanee, maintaining Kokanee hatcheries, and getting Kokanee planted in more lakes. That would be great. Um, Kokanee used to be a lot more widespread um, for eastern United States anglers, but most of those fisheries have gone away because they stopped planting them. Um, or they just weren't managed well. The only state that's an exception to that rule is Connecticut, which has one of the longest running kokanee programs east of the Mississippi. In fact, it does have the longest running one. And that's been very successful, and they produce kokanee upwards of two pounds in their lakes, which is very quality fish. This dropper's big up to big enough. Look at that. It's going crazy back there. I think one of the ironies of threats to kokanee is not that uh, that there's too few fish, but I think that in fact overstocking is a major problem in a lot of our kokanee lakes. The overstocking stunts the fish. It makes the fishery less interesting. I would rather see kokanee fisheries where we're reducing the stocking rate in lakes and getting larger sized fish, but also stocking more lakes with kokanee. So use that surplus to really expand opportunity for kokanee anglers so they're not having to drive you know, two or three hours to get to a kokanee lake. Uh, so I think you know, that would be one of the things I would really like to see states move forward with is the, is the less intense stocking. Oh, that's a fatty. That's a fatty. Come on, fatty. No, 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 stay down. Your antics underwater. Woo! Yeah, that's a two. Nice, got one on the downrigger. This is gonna be fish number 10 if I can get it in the boat. And notice right below this video here, there's a little storefront merch bar that uh, I now have a bunch of really cool spilt milk productions, merchandise, t-shirts, and things like that. T-shirt sweaters. And stickers be sure and grab one of those to help support this channel I'll be releasing new stuff all the time with some really new cool designs there we go that's number 10 well I hope that alleviates your fears about investing in kokanee for the future I think they're a fishery that's gonna be here to stay for a long time and I think more states are gonna come on board and get uh, more excited about kokanee as they see how excited people are about them I'll see you next time out on the water. Just remember, fish smarter, not harder. Bye, guys.